got to move this industry forward. We have to break down the silos between developers and designers and contractors. Like we are literally designing and building and shaping communities and the planet. Absolutely beautiful. Um, you know, just you know, arriving at the airport, driving over here. Uh, what a beautiful town and an amazing place to, to host this uh, event. I also love the layout, um, and it's perfect for a talk about the economy because there's going to be a little bit of economy, there's going to be a little bit of politics, there's going to be a little bit of real estate. But these are all topics for which I'm hoping folks will not hesitate to jump in, interrupt me, either to offer an anecdote, to disagree, whichever one it is. Uh, please don't be shy. We have about half an hour uh, together to, to go over some of this material. In terms of uh, my background, uh, I am with uh, the Stern School of Business at NYU. Most of my time is focused on uh, the real estate sector. I teach you know, a very traditional capital markets course uh, in the finance department, uh, but the course that uh, I also teach when I'm not teaching capital markets is artificial intelligence and machine learning applications in the real estate industry, and that covers a pretty broad range of potential applications. It's also sort of a fairly open-ended course in the sense that we don't have a huge number of long and well-established AI applications in the real estate industry. Um, and that really gives our students the opportunity, whether they be engineers, whether they be MBAs, uh, you know, to think about uh, ways in which we can disrupt the industry. And what I tell each and every one of them, particularly now as some of them are growing concerned about you know, prospects in the job market, you know, whether you know, what the next couple of years will look like for real estate, I cannot think of another time in our industry where uh, you know, the most established legacy players in real estate have uh, been more open uh, to new ideas about how they can do things differently. Um, and I think that while all of us, you know, we're a self-selecting group here, we may take that for granted, um, you know, in the real estate industry as a whole, uh, the idea of uh, change um, and of upsetting more traditional and established ways of doing things um, is not something that uh, you know, has been the norm uh, for most of our industry's modern history. Uh, the other side of this, and I'm a bit biased in terms of some of the analysis that I'll offer up, um, is that uh, my, real, my research interests are on one hand in uh, you know, real estate finance and capital markets, uh, but uh, also on the other hand um, in infectious disease epidemiology. Um, the, the connection between the two did not matter or was not apparent to anyone until March of 2020. Um, and, uh, but it's given us, I think, a real chance to think about how it is that we can think about uh, you know, the impact of the way in which we build and design spaces, whether they be private spaces or, or open public spaces, on the health of communities and individuals uh, because of the way in which you know, they use the spaces uh, in which they are working or, or residing, or you know, perhaps even more importantly, uh, the way in which you know, the location of a space uh, that you work in or, or reside in gives you access to a whole range of other public or ex uh, amenities that are external to the property. Um, and on the residential side, we can see that in spades in some of the data that's already beginning uh, to become available to us. Significant increases in the rates of obesity in segments of the population uh, that did not live close to readily accessible and safe public parks during the pandemic. Um, that increase in obesity then not um, uh, advancing or, or resulting in an increase in um, infectious disease outcomes, but more chronic diseases. And so all of the things that we relate in a sort of modern society to increases in the rate of obesity, increases in the rates of uh, obesity-related cancers, uh, cardiovascular issues, diabetes, the things that ultimately you know, kill more Americans than anything else following the epidemiological transition of the early 20th century are all, are all things that you know, we see sort of a very real and unfortunate case study playing out on the ground in America today. And it feeds into a larger conversation when we're thinking about things like build to rent, single family rentals, housing opportunity, transit oriented communities around the country, how it is that we make sure that uh, you have access to all of the amenities that allow you to be and you allow your family uh, to be healthy, um, even if uh, you are uh, more income constrained than the person who can afford to live right across the street from Central Park. 
So what do we see happening in, in the economy? Uh, what I can tell you in terms of my bottom line up front is that there is no easy way out of our current circumstance for the United States or global economies over the course of the next couple of years. The best case scenario for us in the United States is one where the labor market remains healthy, as it is today, uh, where uh, inflationary pressures begin to subside uh, without a significant overreaction on the part of the Federal Reserve. Part of that uh, would require an end to what I see currently as a significant conflict between monetary and fiscal policy in the United States, where monetary policy ultimately in raising interest rates and raising the underlying cost of capital you know, only has one mechanism through which it hopes to slow things down and reduce those price pressures. It's trying to slow the economy, and that is the way that it gets there. Um, but fiscal policy, particularly as we head into you know, a very contentious midterm election, um, and where we will you know, very quickly after the midterm elections move into you know, presidential election cycle, you know, fiscal policy really pushing very hard uh, to uh, you know, uh, ensure that you know, job growth and economic growth r remain healthy. That significant conflict is probably the most significant risk that we face to the overall growth outlook to the United States today. Historically, when those two have come into conflict, the Fed has had to work more aggressively to contain those price pressures, and the way that it has done that is ultimately not to just slow the economy, but to push the economy into a more protracted period of recession. Uh, when we look at some of the language from uh, various Fed governors and FOMC voting members you know, yesterday and this morning, you know, I think the market's expectation um, as of sort of you know, last night's market close, when we look at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange you know, options trading desk, is that by mid-2023, and this is not sort of me as an economist or someone with a policy orientation, uh, but really just looking at sort of, you know, the bond market and what the markets are trying to tell us about their expectation, uh, that we'll likely see um, you know, a Fed funds target in the range of about 4.25 to 5.5% by mid-2023. We think about what that means for the underlying cost of capital, whether it be you know, the pressure on cap rates or debt yields to the commercial real estate sector, multifamily, uh, as well as the commercial real estate asset classes, uh, and what that also means um, in a you know, feedback mechanism that may actually support, and I believe will support, outcomes in the multifamily sector, what all of this means for uh, our capacity you know, as Americans to become homeowners for the first time. Um, as much as we've seen you know, the 10-year the treasury or the short end of the yield curve increase over the course of the last six or seven months, we've seen an even greater increase in those 30-year mortgage rates uh, that belies sort of the inversion of the yield curve uh, when we're looking just at those treasuries. So in the housing market today, it's no surprise that things have slowed down dramatically. We've gone from a 30-year mortgage rate that earlier this year was on the order of about 2.9 to 3 percent. To, um, uh, to, 3%, uh, to uh, today, it's come down a couple of basis points this week, but it's still at about 6.6, 6.7 percent. You know, based on our, you know, our baseline projection, um, and obviously we're doing a, we're sort of undertaking a probabilistic. Uh, you know, uh, framework in doing this modeling work. We, you know, we're, we're not sort of you know, prescriptive in terms of exactly what we think will happen. Uh, but my team's sort of you know, outlook on this is that we're very likely to find ourselves in the range a year from now um, in terms of the 30 year mortgage rate, you know, somewhere uh, around 7.5 to 8%. That marks a significant shift you know, from where we were, not only in terms of the capacity of you know, young American families or aspirational American families to become homeowners for the first time. Because um, you think about what that does to the lifetime cost uh, of owning a home, but it also means that we see a less efficient allocation of housing resources in the United States overall. Because if you are in your home, even if your family circumstances have changed, because your family is growing, or maybe your son and daughter you know, have gone off to college and you don't need as much space. Maybe you're thinking about retiring, maybe you're thinking about moving into independent living, but that reallocation that will happen from time to time you know, across the household life cycle is something that is impaired when you've got a nice home and a 2% 30-year mortgage, but selling that home at whatever the price point might be means that you are then buying into a mortgage you know, at a mortgage rate that is two and a half to three times higher than where you currently live. Um, that will uh, have a negative impact on mobility and the efficiency of allocation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, obviously, the um, I'm trying to think how I want to frame this. The monetary policy response through the federal funds rate is obviously the most visible Fed action. But yep. they also recently, I believe, stopped buying 
mortgage backed securities. Yeah. Can you tease those two out and which one do you think is more um, impactful? Yeah, so I, I think you're absolutely right that the most visible set of Fed actions, um, in part because of the optics of it. Right, so you know, we've got sort of an observational bias at work in this market where you know, there's a very discreet date you know, where they make a decision and there's a lot of news about it and the market reacts and there's all kinds of excitement and so we tend to fixate on that. But to your point, uh, I think what we see is that the Fed's balance sheet over the course of uh, the pandemic and certainly in, you know, sort of, you know, in the immediate months and weeks of the pandemic grew uh, at a much faster rate and more forcefully than what we saw during the great financial crisis. Um, and so that balance sheet is extraordinarily large. The Fed is now sort of at a point where it is not undertaking new acquisitions and it's allowing the balance sheet to sort of, you know, I wouldn't say wind down uh, because it's a, going to be a very, very slow process uh, uh, you know, that you know, brings down the balance sheet at, at a modest pace as compared to the rate at which it, it grew. Um, but the fact that you've taken essentially you know, one of the biggest, if not the biggest buyers of, the, of, of net new issuance out of the market makes a, a big difference. And I think that is why you see, um, and you know, for, as far as the, you know, the MBS piece of this is concerned, you know, there, there's still a lot of debate and discussion. But I think that is why, in part why you see that the 30-year mortgage rate that we all sort of ultimately experience directly as home buyers or refinancers has increased more than any of these other rates. It's because it's not just the Fed action at the very short end of the policy uh, spectrum. They control the Fed funds target. At best, they exert you know, a modest level of influence over sort of, you know, the tenure. Uh, but in uh, sort of you know, exiting from purchases of those longer term bonds, uh, you know, the combined effect of those two things has made you know, housing opportunity uh, you know, Really, it's pushed it very far out of reach you know, for a lot of Americans. So that is a critically important point. Um, there are six things that uh, I want to highlight as forces really sort of you know, shaping uh, my outlook for the economy over the course of the you know, next year to year and a half. And you know, there's, you know, for each of us, we're going to have a list that is going to include a lot of other things. It's tough to sort of you know, pick out you know, the ones that you want to highlight. Number six, where I've included equity, climate, and health resilience, again, is probably just a reflection of my own bias and thinking that you know, as much as we focus you know, in the commercial real estate sector today on things like building electrification, reducing our carbon footprint, for those of us who are based in New York, whether it is a carrot or a stick, we've got local law 97 that is now motivating you know, some of the changes that we'll make to, to larger commercial properties, uh, but I also believe that you know, that focus will uh, expand uh, to include uh, the health and wellness characteristics of the spaces that we build, whether they be the actual properties or the, 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 the surrounding spaces as well. The six things really shaping the outlook for me, one is just the risk of recession. At this point, whether or not we are in, whether we will be in a recession, whether the, and it's the National Bureau of Economic Research in Cambridge, Massachusetts, that um, you know, will make that determination, the Business Cycle Dating Committee. It's a semantic argument at this point, right? Whether we're slightly to the left or the right of uh, our measurement of expansion or contraction. Uh, what we know is that there are initial indications now you know, of the labor market starting to slow. Yesterday's uh, you know, initial unemployment claims data were up by about 29,000 to about, I think, 219,000, um, which is the highest that we've seen in a while. It was above economists' expectations. Very difficult to make any kind of inference off of one data point, particularly because we know that some of the uh, initial claims were concentrated in parts of the country that were impacted by hurricanes. Um, and so that could very easily reverse, you know, two weeks from now where we see that initial claims actually just drop off a little bit. Um, but there is some evidence of modest weakening in the labor market. We want to take that in context because overall the labor market is near the strongest that it has ever been. And that is part of what is pushing on prices in the economy. That we sort of live in this very odd world where when we look at measures of business and consumer sentiment, you know, they're both depressed. Um, and consumer sentiment, by some measures, is weaker than it was you know, in March and April of 2020 when we all sort of you know, went home and locked ourselves in our apartments and houses. The, that being said, consumers are continuing to spend. Um, they're uh, in many of the relevant categories. We've seen sort of you know, a shift away from you know, uh, consumption and durable goods purchases, which really dominated things during the early stages of the pandemic. You know, we can go out again, we can do things, and so we're going to restaurants, we're going to movie theaters, we're going to you know, concerts, uh, the, uh, but, uh, and spending on those things has not abated significantly. Um, and so although you know, we would normally expect that a nervous consumer 
in an environment where you know, the news begins every day with talk of recession or war in another part of the world would sort of you know, restrain themselves a little bit in terms of their spending activity, we're really not seeing a, a lot of that at this point. So risk of recession is the first one. The second uh, key characteristic or driver of, of uh, the outlook is the rising cost of capital. And again, when, uh, when I say amid policy conflict here, what I'm really referring to is that policy conflict between um, the Federal Reserve um, and, um, and fiscal policymakers. The third, labor market disequilibrium. And here again, we really need to disentangle. We are not gonna get our hands around what is going on with uh, your underlying drivers of inflation unless we really begin to tackle the wage price spiral. What allows for prices in the economy to continue to rise? Uh, the main driver you know, is going to be uh, the capacity you know, of consumers to actually engage in spending because 70, 75% of economic activity um, an overwhelming majority of growth drivers in the United States remains as it has been for most of modern economic history, consumers spending and buying things. And this will be if we had an extra hour we could fight about abundance uh, because there are two sides to the discussion of abundance. One is related to supply and this idea of scarcity where we don't have enough stuff to go around. But scarcity doesn't exist solely as a supply side feature of the market. Scarcity only occurs in an environment where you also introduce demand. And I think when we're thinking about reducing our carbon footprint, when we're thinking about abundance and context, when we're thinking about scarcity, what we must also concede is that we are the most wasteful society in human history. Um, and a lot of the things that we believe are scarce uh, are scarce simply because we believe we need them when maybe we do not. Um, and that is a very sort of you know, subjective uh, argument to explore, uh, but uh, suffice it to say, um, there are two sides to our thinking about whether or not there is enough stuff to go around. Um, so we'll talk about labor market disequilibrium because we do have this really unusual thing going on where firms are nervous, people are nervous, but no one is being let go from their job involuntarily. Where we do have folks that are rolling over into new positions, um, it's not sort of you know, random. Uh, we see a very, very clear correlation between the level of compensation that people are receiving, the way in which their own individual firms are able to raise that compensation level, and the likelihood that they move. And so while we may feel in our own industries that, gosh, you know, we're having a hard time with recruitment, retention, you know, we're having to think more strategically about advancement to keep our key people, when we look at leisure and hospitality, what we'll see is that as compared to professional and business services, compared to information technology, various occupational categories used by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, when we look at the folks that are working in retail, that are working in restaurants, that are working at the front desk of a hotel, the labor turnover rate is six to eight times higher than anything that we're observing in our professional occupations. Um, and there is a very clear correlation when we look at occupational categories and labor turnover uh, with the level of compensation. People are going across the street. You know, they're not necessarily going from working in leisure and hospitality to being a coder at Google. Uh, they are staying within their own industry, but by going across the street, they're able to engineer and elicit a higher increase in their pay um, than they would get if they stayed put. Um, and uh, I don't see this as sort of any, I wouldn't characterize this as, you know, sort of, you know, folks not being able to commit, you know, to a job or an employer or investing in sort of a relationship as much as people simply trying uh, to keep pace with uh, ultimately what looks like an erosion in, you know, their family's real spending capacity. Um, folks are doing what they have to to make ends meet. Um, and you know, we know that you know, for a lot of the folks that are most impacted by these inflationary pressures, um, they're folks that don't own their homes, that do rent, and that a significant driver of uh, their year-over-year -year cost increases are going to be the ways in which multifamily rents across the United States have been increasing. There's some evidence, it's very conflicted, but there is some evidence from the last, I'd say, two months that some of those rent increases um, in the multifamily sector have been abating or moderating. Um, but again, I think it's probably too early to say uh, whether or not that is a pattern that will be sustained. Um, given the housing dynamics, it's unlikely that it will be. So labor market disequilibrium, the next robust availability of equity, debt, and analytical capacity. We think about the ways in which this downturn or softening of the economy, whichever one it ends up being, um, you know, differs from the great financial crisis. The fact that the underlying financial system is functioning well, that when we look at, and I hope you don't mind my picking out PGM, when we look at the debt portfolio of PGM, you wouldn't know that 
you know, uh, things weren't going perfectly well. I mean, we've got balance sheets that are extraordinarily strong. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, loan portfolios uh, that do not evidence any kind of significant distress in the way that we will observe, have observed in the real economy over the course of the last couple of years. Um, so that equity is there, the debt is generally available. Sure, there are some individual banks, there are going to be you know, some life companies, there's going to be the conduit uh, that perhaps has been most impacted because you know, it is so direct, is so sensitive to interest rate changes. So you know, I think what we see is that you know, while there has been some you know, reshuffling of the deck in terms of who is bringing debt to market, who is bringing equity to market, overall, large institutional participants in this market have been you know, so judicious and, and thoughtful um, in their underwriting practices uh, that uh, you know, the health of these institutions allows them to remain very engaged, uh, even uh, in a period of significant uncertainty. Equity and debt is what we would normally be talking about. I've added to the list analytical capacity. Still get questions like, you know, how will apartment or office cap rates adjust to you know, higher treasury yields? We have enough data in our industry today and enough analytical capacity that we can be much more nuanced than thinking about how an entire sector at a national level you know, will respond to a change in the underlying cost of capital. Um, and uh, that is going to be a big differentiator for us. We just have more information available to us, allowing us to make more decisions in real time uh, with regard to sort of investments that we may be thinking about undertaking or, or investments that we already hold on balance sheet. Redistribution of spatial activity across and within markets you know, it was one of the hallmarks of the dinner table conversation for most of the last two and a half years. For most of us, it will manifest in terms of our discussions around the future of the office sector. Um, the, and, you know, and, and that is one that I think for all of us is not only a question professionally, but a question personally, because each one of us has had the experience of having to tackle with how as a manager or an executive within our organization, we want to craft that return to office policy. I don't call it return to work because that would imply that we don't have a lot of people who are working very, very hard from wherever they happen to be. Um, another dimension of this though is that the redistribution of spatial activity across the metropolitan area is something that impacts not just the office sector, but how often you go into work is also a determinant of where it is that you think about where you want to live, where it is that you decide to shop, where it is that you decide to go for dinner. And so we're seeing shifts in the locus of economic and social activity you know, that transcend what is going on with office. It impacts every single aspect of how we think about the built environment. The other dimension of this, of course, is the idea, uh, and there's been no shortage of articles you know, in the popular press early in the pandemic uh, that would focus on this idea of a mass migration of people from the Northeast and Midwest of the United States you know, to Florida and to Texas. On the margins, it is certainly the case that the competitive advantage you know, in terms of you know, tax structure, quality of infrastructure, cost of living, you know, are highly advantageous you know, to the South and to emerging markets like Asheville. Uh, but what we also know um, is that for most folks, uh, they remain tethered to their place of work, even if it is only one or two days a week. And so the data that we're looking at, and it's not you know, the, you know, the ultimate data source to help us prove out our hypotheses on these things, we'll only get with a year or two years lag, it's going to be you know, tax records. Uh, but in the meantime, you know, a combination of uh, you, know, uh, you know, moving company data, which is a, you know, needs to be sort of interpreted very, very carefully. Postal service uh, data from the USPS on sort of, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know mail forwarding, um, you know, looking at sort of, you know, housing sales data, combining a, a wide range of uh, data sources that, you know, in the world of commercial real estate, we would think of as sort of alternative or non-traditional data sources. We're not looking at sort of just simply, you know, rents and occupancy rates and sort of, you know, concessions on leases and lease terms. Um, but there are all these, you know, uh, adjacent uh, data sources. What it, you know, clearly shows us is that people have been far less likely to pick up from New York or Chicago and move halfway across the country or to Vermont. They've been far more likely to say, okay, if I'm going into the office or I anticipate going into the office a couple of days a week, but not five days a week, then I can optimize my household's location preference across simply a wider geographic area. You know, I lived close to Midtown, not because I necessarily wanted to be there, but because you know, moving further away meant a one and a half hour commute each way. 
Uh, but if I only have to do that a couple of times a week, then I can also start to rebalance my thinking about all the other things that will maximize my utility function. And for a lot of people, in particular, aging millennials that you know, at, in the great financial crisis may have been in their 20s, but now are in their late 30s and early 40s and actually starting families, um, you know, for that cohort of individuals, you know, part of their utility function you was know, not proximity to their favorite bar or restaurant or friends, it's proximity to a good quality public school. Um, and that is really leading to a lot of changes in how people think about where it is that they want to live. And they have the flexibility to be thinking about that uh, because uh, they're not going in you know, to Midtown or Lower Manhattan every day. There are competitive issues that we face in markets across the country uh, because as, you know, as part of sort of this entanglement with changes in the spatial distribution of activity, we also see that not only you know, is a market like New York or Chicago or Philadelphia or Boston disadvantaged in terms of you know, uh, you know, the environment for doing business, taxes, all these other things, but there is in some cases a real and in some cases a perceived deterioration in you know, quality of life and safety and security. Um, and that is also leading folks to make different choices about where it is uh, that they choose to locate. I'm a big champion and cheerleader for New York City. That does not mean uh, that uh, we can't face some of the really tough realities and challenges that we've got head on if we want to ensure that New York remains you know, competitive and continue to build on the agglomeration you know, that has made it such a strong market for most of American history. Uh, right now, the balance of competitive advantage really does rest with different parts of the country than it has historically. Um, and then finally, a strength and investment focus on equity, climate, uh, and health resilience. Um, and we were at the beginnings of that even before the pandemic began. So where are we with the economy? When you know, sort of economists talk about sort of using different letters to characterize sort of the way in which the economy is going up or down, this is as close to a V-shaped you know, uh, contraction and recovery as you could possibly get. Um, and so you can see that sort of, you know, in March and April of 2020, you know, a very abrupt decline in economic activity followed by an equally abrupt resurgence in economic activity. And in part, what this reflects is that, you know, in terms of our public health infrastructure in the United States, we did not know enough about the nature of COVID its tr and its transmission. Um, and we did not have any meaningful lived experience in the United States in managing a pandemic. It's not that we had not experienced significant public health shocks in the United States in the past, but no one who lives and works in the United States today in the public health profession in their lifetimes had ever had to manage around a pandemic. Um, and so what did we do? Uh, well, depending on what company you're at, anywhere between the 10th and the 15th of March, you were told to pick up your laptop, go home. Uh, you locked yourself in your room and you started leaving Amazon boxes on your porch for three days before you would bring them inside. <laughs> um, and it was a weird time. It was a weird time. But I think for all of us, you know, we, were, we, we shouldn't underestimate uh, how lucky we were because most of us were able to go home, as difficult as it was, plug back in, um, and you know, for you know, many people here, you know, alongside the added responsibility of having to take care of you know, kids during the day or elder care, we're still able to you know, plug back in with good quality equipment, a high quality and stable internet connection, you know, and get productive again very, very quickly. And all these things that we thought we would never be able to accomplish in real estate, um, that we'd be sort of you know, stuck in the water if we weren't able to do the site visit, if we weren't able to sort of break bread over lunch or dinner, how will a deal ever get done? It's not that we were as efficient or as effective you know, as we would have been without the pandemic, but we were able to get some things done, which I think sort of is sort of a surprise and a great takeaway. What were we able to get done and what, what were the things that simply we were not able to get done until we were able to resume more normal uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, types of engagement? Um, we all went home and we were lucky because we were able in some fashion and to some degree able to get things done. You know, the folks who were significantly disadvantaged were the ones that didn't have a laptop, didn't have a high speed or stable internet connection or whose the nature of their work required that they be in person at a time where they were not able to be in person. Um, you know, those are the folks that were really then ultimately disengaged from the economy. And you think about the way in which, you know, the pandemic impacted us, particularly if you had a son or daughter, you know, that was maybe in the fifth grade or the sixth grade. It's not only that your income is disrupted, but your entire family, your capacity to engage in society, to be an active citizen without a stable and high quality internet connection, um, you were significantly impaired. And that impacted a lot of people in a way that has 
a long-lasting impact on the way in which we think about labor market dynamics in the United States. So what does this show? We rebounded. How did we rebound so quickly? Well, one, you know, we got a lot of people back to work fairly quickly you know, by summer of 2020, and certainly once vaccines started to become available. But what we also know is that there was a massive, and I should say not massive, unprecedented, you know, for all the superlatives that we use, in terms of the amount of money that we pumped into the economy, uh, you know, unprecedented is, you know, uh, is quite appropriate here. Uh, but the intervention, the extent of the intervention, you know, uh, the federal interventions in the economy during the early stages and mid stages of the pandemic, you know, uh, far outpaced anything that we saw during the great financial crisis. So a lot of money going in. We think about why it is that we've got significant inflationary pressures that continue to linger. We cannot dismiss that in part, you know, it is an inflationary environment of our own making. Uh, because we know that during this period of time there are going to be disruptions to supply. We also know from the data, whether we knew it in real time or not, we can debate, but we also know from the data that the locus of consumption activity when no one could leave their home was going to shift. We were not going out for haircuts, we were not going out to restaurants, we just started to buy things. And when we look at what people, you know, what are the kinds of things that people were buying? And where were the inflationary pressures? It was really focused on durables. What were the things that we were gonna have the hardest time getting? It was going to be the durables, particularly if it came from abroad. So if everyone suddenly decides that they need a new dishwasher, if everyone suddenly decides that they need a new washing machine or a new fridge, um, you know, those are going to be the things that are toughest to get when there are significant global supply chain disruptions, but that's what we all did because there was nothing else to spend your money on. Um, and so, surprise, uh, prices start to go up um, in a way that has lingered, except that now we have seen a significant shift. And again, far less spending on durables. You know, an easy anecdote to explain that story is Peloton, you know, and some of the challenges it's had. And I totally, for all of, you know, I'm not, if you think I have any kind of foresight, I bought a bike and a treadmill. Um, and I am still paying 50 bucks a month for this equipment that, you know, sort of stereotypically, now I use to just sort of hold laundry. Um, the, but you know, I can go back to the gym. Why am I gonna use any of this stuff? Um, so I have this idea that sort of when it gets cold again outside and when it's snowing and I don't wanna go to the gym, I will finally, you know, sort of dust off, you know, the, either the bike or the treadmill um, and, uh, and sort of, you know, get back to the business of Peloton. Um, but sort of what you see over here is that, uh, you know, we did uh, grow very, very quickly, but a lot of that is uh, not private, a lot of that is public uh, support for the economy uh, and part of what has driven inflationary pressures. The more disconcerting thing is sort of the economic outlook. The Wall Street Journal survey of economists is my preferred rather than putting up my own uh, projections because there are uh, about 50 economists who participate and they have wildly divergent views of the way that the world works. And so if you can look and see sort of directionally they're all moving in one direction or the other in terms of their thinking about economy or oil prices, that's a pretty good indication that sort of, you know, we can abstract away from our own particular opinions about whether we like sort of you know, the incumbent administration or not, there's a pretty strong consensus of fairly modest growth, both in 22 and 23. Next week, uh, the IMF will release its updated world economic outlook, and you will see a significant downward adjustment in uh, the IMF's uh, expectations for global growth, um, down to about 2.9%, uh, I believe, uh, we'll see for 2022, and a little above 3% for 2023. Those would be perfectly fine as numbers if we were talking about Canada and the United States or the UK. Uh, but we're also talking about emerging economies that have fast growing populations. Um, growth rates on the order of about 3% in you know, India, in Sub-Saharan Africa, in other parts of Southeast Asia imply a significant deterioration in um, uh, the uh, sort of in people's earning capacity, spending capacity, uh, and ultimately their ability to get by. So uh, th that's gonna be important for us over the course of uh, the next couple of years. Uh, in terms of volatility in the market, though, in spite of all of these headwinds and all of the debate, you know, we don't see uh, exaggerated volatility in the way that we observed you know, during the heights of the financial crisis and uh, the COVID-19 outbreak. Where it does leave us is in a scenario where 
Uh, certainly, if we go by a traditional measure in looking at the yield curve uh, or uh, you know, the, the, you know, the, the 210 spread, uh, what we're going to see is that almost every measure is pointing us to um, you know, our being sort of in the, or the, in the early stages of a recession. The question for us then becomes, you know, what will this recession look like? Uh, overall, my baseline expectation is one that is you know, mild but protracted. Protracted because the Federal Reserve is not going to reverse course on its current monetary policy trajectory until prices come under control. And we have a long way to go to see the labor market cool off enough uh, that those wages uh, begin to stall. Um, but you think about sort of you know, why it is that I opened by saying, you know, we don't have many good paths out of where we are today. So when our best possible scenario is one where you know, we slow people's wages in an environment of rising prices, that's not a great policy outcome. But that's exactly what it is that we're trying to engineer today in the United States. So we're kind of already there in terms of s some of these metrics. The, um, let me take a look at my watch here, which is telling me that I have about five minutes left. Is that right? Ten. Ten? Okay. Thanks. So where does it leave us? L like, any, like any one of my lectures on campus, I, I don't even begin to get uh, 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 too far into, into my slide deck, um, which my, my students find entertaining for the first two weeks. Um, uh, but when I tell them they can just sort of catch up on the other 30 slides on their own before next week, um, they tell me it gets old very quickly. Um, so you know, right now, so we're looking at consumer price growth, you know, as of the summer, up about 8.5% for 22, 6.9%. Um, Wall Street Journal poll puts it at 2.9% in 2023. What I would suggest there is that that is probably optimistic. Uh, I will be very, very surprised if we get down to a number like that. And that is part of why we also need to look at some of these alternative sources of data. You know, when the CME options trading data is telling us that we're heading to about 4.5%, you know, by mid next year on the uh, Fed funds target rate and what that implies for a yield curve, which will not remain inverted indefinitely. Um, it is inconsistent with a 2.9% uh, rate of uh, inflation in 2023. We're likely to see this persist for far longer. One of the questions that has come up um, is, uh, you know, asks whether or not uh, the uh, Federal Reserve will actually adjust its, uh, its target window. Um, that instead of targeting 2% as, you know, as sort of, you know, its definition of price stability, whether it will allow that number to float a, a little bit higher. Uh, I think that uh, the Federal Reserve would lose credibility uh, with, uh, you know, globally and in the United States and with the market um, uh, in a way that would preclude their being able to do that. They have to stick to the 2% number and they simply cannot allow uh, their, their, their target to go higher. There's a lot of other information here uh, for, uh, for my varied skill set. I've never learned to time things uh, you know, very well. Uh, but uh, let me uh, close uh, by showing you uh, just two stylized facts. Part of what continues to exert pressure on those prices, uh, but for a lot of Americans is a good outcome because it's allowing them to, in a modest way, keep pace with those rising prices that the labor market remains exceptionally high. Until July, we had more jobs open and available in the United States than we have ever had. 11.2 vacancies in the United States. As compared to the previous peak, the, you know, the previous highest levels that we had ever seen prior to the pandemic of 7.6 million. One of the numbers we have to watch is how those vacancies come down. They fell by a little over a million just between July and August. So what we do have is a scenario where not as many companies are advertising for new positions. We don't really have any evidence, though, that companies are letting people go. And part of that is simply the realization that when you do, it's going to be very hard to fill that position again. Um, and so the retention piece of the labor market story is giving us a, a little bit of cover here. But the labor market remains exceptionally strong. That turnover is concentrated in the low wage occupations in retail, hotels and restaurant, what we'll call sort of your hospitality. And why are they jumping? Because the job switchers are able to, again, generate wait year over year wage increases that are nearly twice the level that we see for folks who actually stay in their job and get you know, and take, um, you know, sort of a year over year increase that by any historic standards is still very, very generous um, and is sort of at the limits of what uh, their companies can do. Closing point then, so I don't cut into uh, the next panel. Um, there's a lot here 
Uh, but uh, probably the most important is, again, just a quick takeaway on the market. Where does the market see the risk and opportunity in real estate over the course of the next year and a half to two years? Um, I am not so naive as to think that the assets held by real estate investment trusts are representative of the larger pool of commercial real estate assets in the United States. There's selection bias here in terms of what the REITs own, but it does dovetail with our general intuition. As compared to the S&P 500, up about 11% from my benchmark before the pandemic began, the sectors that have struggled to make the case to the public markets, and that's not to say that there aren't really high quality office out, assets out there, but the, the, the sectors that have struggled to make a sector-wide case to the market include office more significantly than any other property type, hotel, healthcare, surprisingly data centers, retail. Uh, what are the favorites? They remain industrial and residential, although in the industrial sector we are starting to see you know, some concerns emerging about whether or not starts and occupancy levels may have allowed us to price to perfection at the peak of the pandemic when industrial seemed like the lifeline for everything that we needed to get to our homes. Um, again, I just want to reinforce that on this office point. Tremendous variation here. When we look at a market like New York, there are going to be some class B and C office buildings that whose highest and best use is no longer as an office building, but whose repurposing may allow for us to alleviate some of the significant erosion of affordability pressures in the workforce and affordable housing sectors in the United States in a way that we may not have seen you know, since the significant repurposing of downtown properties after 9-11. Um, at the other extreme, the very, very best office properties, a one Vanderbilt, a property at Hudson Yards, that are amenitized in a way that is responsive to what firms and their employees want if we're to get people into the office, are commanding rents that are the highest in some cases that we've ever seen for office buildings anywhere in this country. So incredible diversity in terms of what we see in many, many of these sectors and what the and analytical capacity and data allow us to do today, more so than has ever been the case before, is to really differentiate, even within a sector, within a market, within a submarket, where those winners and losers are going to be. Thank you so much. Can you take some questions? So actually, I've been granted a, a couple of minutes for questions. Yeah. Yep. But then we're also not being incentivized to fill that gap. Yep. So is, does that mean that the rising interest rates are actually going to prolong the inflation problem? So when you say, uh, so a supply shortage in the sense of uh, you know, consumer goods overall, re or real estate? Real estate to make, like, you know, I mean, I, I live in California and there's clearly a mismatch between available housing stock and um, that's what's been driving the prices there for a little bit. Yep. Yeah. For, for properties that we have less incentive to necessarily invest, um, there's still, you know, there's still some room to buy that people aren't being encouraged to invest in that. So the interest rates are causing less investment. Yep. But there's still a lot of there's still a lot of pent up demand. Yeah. So I think so that makes inflation go higher. Yeah. So I think when we look at you know the the single family housing market uh, to start. The, I think what we see is that when, you know, the, the, the underlying driver of demand for single family homes and homes in transit oriented communities uh, is going to be demographic drivers in the United States. And the demographics clearly support you know, a shift as compared to where we were you know, 10 or 15 years ago. Because uh, we've got sort of this demographic bulge with aging millennials that are in a very different place from where they were you know, coming out of the great financial crisis. The, uh, the impediment then is the rising interest rate uh, that has done more to erode affordability in the single family housing market than the house price increases that we observed during the pandemic. Because of the downward pressure that you know, weaker demand will exert on prices, um, what we see is that the supply curve has now shifted in. Listing activity has dropped off a cliff. You've got all sorts of folks who are saying, you know, who, who you know, and this is for, in, you know, from a behavioral economics perspective, this is absolutely consistent with what we'd expect to see. They set their price expectation you know, at the highest levels that they observe you know, for their home. 
And when it comes down, they're like, I'm not going to sell at this price that is a discount over what I think my home is worth. They peg it at the peak. Um, and so listing activity falls off because folks, by and large, are locked into you know, very low and affordable mortgage rates. I've got an entire generation of folks that have never known anything up until now than you know two percent treasury yields. Um, the uh, uh, what we see is that um, you know there, there, you know, there, there, there there's no there's very little in the way of forced selling, um, and so you know that that distress that might undercut prices isn't there in, in a significant way. The feedback mechanism where it drives some of our inflation numbers because you know I'm locked into you know an unbelievably low thirty year mortgage rate. Uh, I'm not, and, and I'm not moving uh, because I'm not taking that, you know, that 6.7 percent rate. Um, you know, my experience of inflation as an individual in this economy is radically different from someone who rents in the same market. Uh, the what I believe we see is that although there is some temporary softening in uh, you know some of the rent pressures in major markets around the country. Um, what you do not have and will not have again for the foreseeable future is a standard graduation cycle. And by that, I mean that during any normal period of time where we are not in disequilibrium, you've got a bunch of folks that are graduating from being renters into home ownership, opening up rental opportunities for folks that are coming into the rental market for the first time. You've got a bottleneck now because all of those aspirational homeowners remain renters, but you've still got the new renters coming in. And so the overall pool of renters in the United States begins to grow dramatically over the course of the next couple of years. In terms of both the you know, incentives and capacity to bring new multifamily supply online, we are highly constrained, whether it be land, whether it be zoning, uh, whether it be you know, for higher density you know, and, uh, you know, housing and upzoning in, in transit-oriented communities, whether it be the supporting infrastructure that will allow for multifamily housing, the cost of financing, you know, uh, you know, or the availability of skilled labor. All of these things are acting as constraints on our ability to sort of enhance supply. Um, and so I think that does enhance the inflationary pressures because we're going to be living in an environment of a fairly tight multifamily market for the foreseeable future. Do you see a correlation with the fact that um, with the rising interest rates and also people with inflation that may go in and leverage equity in their home because their home value is more than they've seen in years, right? So if they go in and start to refinance and cash out, yeah. what kind of pressure is that? So I think what we've seen so far is that cash out refinancing activity, uh, like all refinancing activity, has essentially withered away. Um, and uh, the, you know, for most families, you know, they will, uh, and sort of, you know, in the post-crisis you know, financial market structure, you know, if you need the cash, uh, you know, uh, if you need to extract the equity in your home, uh, then you're not going to be able to. Right, the folks who can extract the equity are the ones who have the financial means that they don't need to. Uh, but for those folks, the opportunity cost of capital then has to be higher than 7%. Otherwise, why would they take, uh, why, why would they extract the equity in the first place? But we live in a world where finding you know, a low risk investment opportunity that will yield 7 to 8% at a minimum, you know, those aren't easy to find. Um, as all of us as commercial real estate lenders and investors know, uh, let alone sort of at sort of, you know, the, the level of, uh, sort of an individual household. You're not, you're, it's highly unlikely that we would expect to see a behavior where folks would sort of do that cash out refi at 7% on a HELOC to then invest in a stock market that exhibits significant risk and volatility. Uh, you know, the risk adjusted return on that just doesn't look favorable, so we don't expect to see much of that activity at all. The same with the investment capital. There you go. All right. the, uh, uh, absolutely. Uh, I should say, so I, I only mentioned, uh, you, know, uh, I, you know, when I talked about sort of the strength and underlying resilience of the financial system and, you know, participants in the real estate market, I mentioned uh, PGM I, uh, because, uh, you know, the, the balance sheet is so incredibly strong. Um, and, uh, and, and I think sort of that is one of the differentiators now. We think about some of the key ways in which, you know, the world today, you know, is different from where we were. Uh, you know, in the financial crisis, you know, PGM's balance sheet was incredibly strong through both of those periods. Uh, but, uh, you know, we, we, you know, there are two things that are fundamentally different. We have a well-functioning financial system where there are no obvious cracks. Uh, you know, there, there are some you know, areas of concern, you know, student loans uh, you know, b being one of them. Um, the, but, but the other, when we look at the housing market specifically, and this really speaks to the, you know, the dynamic in the real economy, you know, prices are higher on a nominal and real basis than they were in the housing boom. But um, you know, the reasons are different. You know, prices were higher because of speculative investment and an overabundance of, but also an overabundance of supply responding to that speculative investment during the housing crisis. 
Now we have high prices, uh, you know, uh, not because of an overabundance of supply, but because supply is so incredibly constrained. And on the demand side, only real demand that you know, goes uh, uh, unmet. I'm sure I've taken my five minutes. So again, thank you so much. Uh, yeah.